we're going to be digging deeper into the topic of God. So this is a study of, first of all, who God is. You got your first underlying marking there. Who God is and what God does. So we're going to look at two things from the scriptures about God. <clears throat> so first part now, we're just going to focus on who God is. <clears throat> now, the who God is, things that describe someone are called characteristics. <clears throat> They're also called attributes. So I have certain attributes or I have certain characteristics. Theologians tend to speak about God as having attributes. But for our study, I just use the word characteristics. There are several characteristics. Now, for example, when I'm talking about somebody uh, that they have characteristics, what are the characteristics of this guy? Humble. I want physical characteristics. Oh, okay. Hair. He's yeah. got hair. Yeah, you're nice. Son. In the wrong place. Big hands. Nice smile. <laughs> Got a nice smile. He uses white teeth whitener. Yeah. He uses teeth whitener. He's got blonde hair. He's physically fit. Yeah. Yeah. Just ask him. <laughs> physically fit. Um, so you know that's what the, his physician said. Uh, okay. Yeah. He. All right. That's more what he does. What are some of his physical characteristics? What's his color of his eyes? Anybody know? Blue. I've never gotten that close to him to know. <laughs> How tall is he? Six foot two, somebody said. Are you guessing? Guessing. All of us have characteristics. That's all I'm trying to point out here. I could have put my picture up there and it would have been so obvious. Oh, yeah, don't do that. <laughs> all right. All of us have characteristics. What I want is, we are the sum total of all of our characteristics. So if you could somehow record every characteristic that I have, you'd have a sum total of who I am. And so when we study attributes of God and the characteristics of God, we're trying to get, because uh, we're going to do likewise with God, God is the sum total of all of his characteristics. Now, we don't have all of God's characteristics because God is infinite. So he has revealed to us the characteristics he wants us to know about him. So when I'm going to be talking about the characteristics of God, God has disclosed these to me so I can know something about who he is. All right? Then we'll talk about his actions. I'll know what God does. But right now we want to look at some of God's characteristics. The first one I want to suggest to you is that God is spirit. God is spirit. I know that from what Jesus said, John 4, 24. God is spirit, and his worshipers will worship him in spirit and truth. Tell me what you know about spirit. What is spirit? Give me a characteristic of spirit. God is spirit. Can't see it. Can't see it. I got that on here probably. Therefore, one of he is alive, he's immaterial, and invisible. You pick my last one. Invisible. All right. Spirits are alive, okay? To be spiritually dead just means you're separated from God. It doesn't mean your spirit is dead. You have a spirit, all right? But to be spiritually dead, that is theological terms to say that your relationship with God has been broke off. All spirits are alive. They're immaterial. A spirit, you, you can't touch it. You can't feel it. You can't touch my spirit, all right? I can't touch your spirit. But you could feel, if I hit you in the nose, you would feel that. <laughs> but not in your spirit. You'd feel that in your body. Okay. Now, the spirit, and my, my hymn is, I'm, I'm getting off subject here, but uh, when we get to the doctrine of man, the teaching on man, <clears throat> my, my spirit and my body are so connected by God that when my spirit is removed from my body, my body dies. That's a biblical definition of death. Okay. When your spirit, but my spirit stays alive. It goes either be with God or it goes into to Hades, it goes someplace. The spirit, is always, it's always alive. It's immaterial, and it's invisible. So no one has ever, ever seen God. Because he's invisible. If he's invisible, you can't see him. So he makes himself visible in what we call theophanies. Okay? And the, I think in the ladies' Bible study on Gideon, they've been talking about the theophany, where God made himself visible. 
he made himself visible as a man that started talking and said, hey Gideon, you uh, mighty warrior, all right? And, and so from time to time, God makes himself visible. He made him visible in a pillar of a cloud, and a fire, and an angel, and a man. He, from time to time, will make himself visible. But God himself is immaterial and invisible. Second characteristic of God is he is personal. <clears throat> he is personal. Yeah? Uh, I need another pen. This one's dry. Oh, pen. We got plenty of pens. We have a final sheet. That was an easy one to answer. I thought you had a theological question. How many angels can dance on the head of a pen? <laughs> this is an extra one. Do you know what my answer is? Probably a lot. <laughs> Those uh, that's, that's as good as I'm going to do. You need a pen too? Yeah, that's fine. All right, keep going. Don't take my cookie. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you can't see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now he's like, oh, I want to use the one I want to try. All right, anybody else need a pen while we're getting this? Like, do do we need to sign in like we did last week? Oh, I sign left. This, I don't have a sign-in sheet. Diane, remember who's here? Oh. <laughs> All right, God is personal. All right, yeah. by that it means God has intellect. He knows. And I got Psalm 147 5 because God thinks. God thinks, all right? He has emotions. John 3 16. For God so loved, love is an emotion. In a Semitic mind, it's also more than just an emotion, it's a, a volition involved there. It's just, a choosing emotion and God has a will he chose us we'll find that when we get a little bit further in the study God chose us and there's very, very several places so he's got intellect emotion and will those are the three things primary things that determine whether you're a person okay a couple other things self-awareness is another one God is self-aware he knows who he is I am that I am he said and self-determination I decide what I'm going to do I have a rational plan of what I'm going to do. I get up in the morning, I'm going to go brush my teeth, okay? I, I, I have self-determination. Those are basically the five things that characterize a person. Now, personality is different from person. Personality is how I individualize my person. You know, I can be outgoing in my intellect, emotional, well, self-determination, and self-sensibility, or I can be introverted and I will have different personality on how I use those five things, okay? And that, but person means God is, God is a person, this is so important, because therefore, because he's personal, you can have a personal relationship with God. You can have a personal relationship with God. The chair here cannot think, can't choose, you know, I can't feel anything. I can beat that chair all day long. It won't feel a, feel a thing. Now, I'll probably be sore afterward. But the, so, it's not personal. I can't have a personal relationship with it. A person has to have an intellect, emotion, and will. So I can have a personal relationship with God. That is a really important point. That I can really know God and have a relationship with Him. The next one is God is self-existent. In Exodus chapter 6, verse 2, God tells Moses, God said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appear to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty, but by the name Lord, I did not make myself known to them. And here I have the name Lord. And it's called the Tetragrammaton. It is the four letters in Hebrew. A Yoda, a Hey, a Bob, a Hey. And that's like a Y H W H. There are no vowels with it because the original Hebrew didn't put any vowels, you just knew the vowels. And so we believe today that it is pronounced Yahweh, or if you can't say the W, pronounce it as a V, it's Yahweh. Now, how we got the name Jehovah out of that is they took the vowels from the word Adonai, and they put the vowels Adonai, which means Lord, as in a master, my Lord, my master, Lord. They put them with this word, Yahweh, they substitute those vowels for Adonai vowels, so it comes out <coughs> Jehovah, because uh, the, 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 the Yehovah, Yehovah, you put Adonai with it. Why did they do that? Well, the Jews do. You're not supposed to take the name of the Lord your God in vain. 
And so rather than pronounce the sacred name of God, they substituted the vowels for Adonai, and every time they came across it, they knew you really can't pronounce those vowel combination with this word. And so you would have to pronounce it Adonai, and you could not take the name, the sacred name of God in vain, because you didn't say it. Is that, is, see how it's cheating? Yeah, just because that's one of those acceptable cheaters. Right. What's that? It's cheating. It's cheating. Yeah, yeah cheating. Huh? <laughs> they did not want to. They revered God's name so much that they would not take it in vain. But the whole point here is the name itself, okay, comes from Exodus 3.14. God said to Moses, I am who I am. Eh, yeah, eh, yeah. That's what the text says. It comes from this word here. And God was saying, eh, Moses, who am I going to tell them that sent me? He says, you tell them, eh, yeah, eh, yeah. And now, in Hebrew, there's no time in, in, in their verbs. We have past, present, future. They have state of existence. It's either continuing or it's not continuing. It's all happened. And so context tells you whether it was in the past, present, or future. And so what this verse says actually says, if I could, I could really translate this, I am that I am, or I was what I was, or I will be what I will be. What is it saying? I exist because I exist. <laughs> I am the self-existent, always existing one. That's what this name means. When I say the Jehovah or Yahweh, I'm saying he is the one who always forever exists and will always forever exist, and he exists right now. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? It's all in that one little, that name right there. What's called the Tetragrammaton, four letters, gramma, written for, tetra, and, and that's, we'll hear people speak of it as Tetragrammaton, that uh, they're using these four letters and they don't want to pronounce the name of God. Very interesting. All right. He is self-existent. Our grandson came home from school and said he's been taught evolution in school and he believed that, and so grandma asked him, uh, where did everything begin? And he said it became two rocks struck together. Everything came out of those two rocks striking together. And grandma, grandma said, well, where did those two rocks come from? He stopped. Mm -hmm. I said, grandma, good question. <laughs> 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 See, you back it up to the very beginning, we got a self existing God. Always was, always will be, always is. I, I, I can't make it even. Always is. He is in the past, He is in the present, He is in the future. And so Jesus was able to say, Before Abraham was, I am. I am right now existing in past to you, but I am existing. God exists so differently than we do. We almost have to throw out what we know about existing and just use our abstract thinking because God made us to think abstractly. To abstractly try to comprehend how great our God is. But this is what God reveals about himself. He is self-existing. All right? <clears throat> now, the Bible says God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Not two. Not three. He's not, uh, you know, a whole host of gods. He is just one God. It says, therefore, my, my conclusion is, therefore, he is unique. And he alone is God. There's no one else that is like him. He is, he is one God. Not a multiplicity of God. God is eternal. This is my next one. God is eternal. Uh, the eternal God is your refuge, and underneath are everlasting arms. I put a circle here for eternal. Some put the infinity sign, but I didn't like the crisscross intersection. A circle has no beginning and end. Can you tell me where the beginning is? In fact, I generated this on the computer, so it didn't even start a beginning. It put the boom. It was all there at the same time. It wasn't like when I would draw a circle, I start somewhere, and I go around and make the circle, and so you could say, I find the beginning. Not so. God has no beginning, no ending, so I use a circle to, to illustrate that. And, and so the result is he has no beginning, he has no end. That's, that's God. That just blows me away. I went up to, uh, my son was in the bedroom and he said, Dad, I just don't feel good. I said, what's the problem, son? He said, Dad, my head hurts. I said, well, you got a headache? I'll get you some aspirin. He said, no, 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 Dad, it's not that kind of hurting. He said, 
I've been trying, I've been thinking about forever and it's making my head hurt. <laughs> without end. Without end. Without beginning. You see, that defies everything we know. Everything we know has beginning and end. Everything. And God has no beginning, no end. He is eternal. Which is just a mind boggling concept. All right? He is omnipresent. <laughs> Omni means everywhere present. So he's everywhere present. And we know this in 1 Kings 8.27. Solomon is dedicating the temple to God in his lofty prayer that he makes. He says, but will God really dwell on earth? Here's his question. He's will God really, God, are you really going to dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. Listen to this. The heavens of the heaven. So we got the heavens, and the, the heavens of heavens. He's saying you take the whole everything, the whole entire universe. This is a Hebrew idiom saying the whole, the whole thing. You take the whole thing, and God, you supersede all space. You go beyond everything that is. Oh my goodness, this is mind boggling. He's saying, so God, if if everything that is, the whole universe can't contain you, how are you going to dwell in this temple I have made? How are you going to be here? Whoa, that's a great question, isn't it? <laughs> if it's a good question, you don't, normally don't get a good answer. But we'll see later if I were to back up uh, a couple of them to God is one. Part of one is called, uh, he's numerically one, but he's one in the sense he's not composed of parts. I'm composed of parts. I got fingers, I got toes, I got eyes, I got ears. But God is spirit. He is one. He's not composed of parts. This is mind-boggling stuff. Because God is not composed of parts. It's not like, hmm, I got a part of God in my hand right there. But God supersedes everywhere in the whole space. So I just got a part of God? No. You take the smallest indivisible point on the tip of my finger and the entire Godhead is there. He is everywhere present at the same time. Everywhere. He is right there. They call call God, he, and, and theologians they call, speak of him as the simplicity of God. He is a, not simple in the sense that, that God is a dummy or something, but he is simple in the fact that he's not made of a lot of different parts. I am complex because I got a soul, I got a spirit, I, I've got a mind, I, I've got parts of my body. I'm a complex creature, but God is one. And so when God, wait, wait, wait. when the whole heavens cannot contain, He supersedes it all, but yet He is everywhere present at the exact same time in His totality, blows my mind. I just can't hardly wrap my, my mind around that, right? He supersedes all space. We cannot escape His presence anywhere. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 10. If I go into hell, God is there. If I go into heaven, He's there. I cannot go anywhere that God is not there. Did I tell you about the little boy? The preacher was preaching on this whole thing about God is everywhere, everywhere. Before service, he'd stop and got a hot dog. He, and he ate part of it, stuck the other part, wrapped it up, put it in his pocket. The preacher was preaching. He's telling me God is everywhere. You know, he, he's he's in the he's in the seat next to you, he's seat beside you, seat in front of you, seat behind you, and he said, you know, he's everywhere. He said he's in your purse, he's in your wallet, he's in your pocket, and the kid jumped up and said, hey Lord, please don't eat my hot dog. <laughs> <coughs> we were saying, God is everywhere. <coughs> in the totality of his being, he's everywhere because he's not composed of parts. I can't chop them up, all right, and, and say, oh, I got a piece of them here or there. God is also omnipotent, which means all powerful. In Genesis 17, Abraham was 99 years old, and the Lord appeared to him. There was a theophany. He made himself visibly in the form of a man. And he said, I am God Almighty. There's my word, Almighty. He said, I'm God the omnipotent one. Walk before me and be blameless. Walk before me and be blameless. Blameless. Come on in. Come on in. You can join us. Walk before me and be blameless. But God is almighty. God's power never diminishes. So, 
Did everybody get the sign-in sheet? Everybody got it. All right. God's power never ever diminishes. So in Genesis chapter 1, when God creates, all right, and on the seventh day, he rested from everything that he had created. All right? When, when, when he did that, it wasn't like he sat down and said, whew, man, am I out of energy. I, I just, I've just created all this, and I've got to recharge my batteries. Because he never, he's got all power, all power. So when it says he rested, it's more like when I completed the painting party we had here the other night. Okay, we had my hands up and everybody was painting. And uh, when we got all done, we would say, it's finished. And we are resting in satisfaction of our accomplishment. The rest is in that, it's that sense of, ah, ah. In fact, in God's case, he looked and he saw everything that he made that it was perfect. So then he said, it was very good. And he goes, ah. That's the rest. You see, it's, it's not exhausted, replenish my energy. God is almighty. In fact, therefore, he can do everything except contradict himself. He can't contradict himself. God can do everything but contradict himself. You know, we're talking about God can do everything, and a kid in the class says, oh, can God make a rock so big that he can't pick it up? Well, that'd be contradicting himself. And even in logic, they'd say that's illogical. You can't, that's an illogical question, an illogical expectation that you're going to do. If God can do everything, can he not exist? Well, no, that's illogical, okay? But people ask those kind of dumb questions, okay? He can do everything. That's why I put this in. He can do everything except contradict himself. And that's what the word holy comes in. He is always, okay, holy means he's separate. I think I'm probably getting ahead of myself. It means he's separated from everything that is, contradicts who he is. In fact, that might be the next one. Oh, the next one is omniscient. Omniscience, he no, no science, I know all. God is our, our Lord and mighty in power. We're talking about all powerful. His understanding has no limits. God understands everything. And, uh, understanding here is not in the sense of Boy, I understand what you feel, man. I've been, I've gone through that with you. <laughs> All right, maybe I should have picked somebody else. <laughs> it's not that I, you know, I sympathize understanding. The idea is you're understanding. He knows everything. Because he knows everything, he has always known everything, and he never learned anything. God never learned anything. He's always known everything. Some people have this idea when it speaks about foreknowledge that God looks down a tunnel through time and he sees what's going to happen and so he knows beforehand what's going to happen because he sees it beforehand and so he learns what's going to happen in the future by looking through the tunnel of time. No. God has always known what is going to happen or we'll find out later why he knows that. It's because he knows his own plan and everything operates on his plan. This is so mind-boggling. God is so much greater and so much bigger, so much other than the way we are. We try to put God into a box that he is like us, and he is not. God is really, really great, bigger than us. He has, has always known everything and has never learned anything. This is mind-boggling. The next one is characteristic of God is he is unchanging. You see, if he were to learn something, then he would have changed. So if he's unchanging, he can't have ever learned anything. Likewise, he can never forget anything. If he forgot something, he's changed. But the Bible says every good gift, perfect gift, comes from above, uh, from the Father of heavenly lights, talking about God the Father, who does not change like a shifting shadow. As, as the sun moves, the shadow changes. He said, God's not like the shadow. When circumstances around change, God never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I think I got that up there next. Therefore, He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. God 
never changes. He's never learned anything, never forgotten anything. He has never increased in power or diminished in power. All of these things. God, God exists so differently than we do. It just makes me stand in awe. I serve this God. This God. All right? The next one, God is sovereign. In Revelation 6.10 it says, They called out in a loud voice, How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge their blood? I think i got another definition for it. Yeah. Because he is most high, he does as he pleases. The whole idea of sovereign, God is most high. There is no God higher than him. You know, like in the Greeks, they have a pantheon of gods. Zeus is at the top, and you go down, you got Mer Mercury, and you, you got all these other sub-gods. It's not that way. He is the most high, final court of the appeal. You, you can't go any higher. He is it. He is the sovereign Lord. And because he is sovereign, he has no one to give an account to but himself. He does as he pleases. We get this wrong sometimes. We try to dictate to God what we want. And I should be saying, Lord, your humble servant here is ready to do what you want. What you want, all right? God is holy. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. This is the standard. Okay, I am to be like God. He made me in his image. We'll learn more about that when we talk about how God made man. God is holy. This is a characteristic. And it has two concepts. On the negative side, if there's a negative aspect of holiness, I separate from something. I'm separated from. That's why in the Christian holiness movement in the, in the last century or so, the people lived separated, a very separated simple life they wanted to be get the world out of their life and live just for God okay so the one is I separate from evil sinful behaviors worldliness I separate from my my temptations that are brought up within me on the other hand there's a positive side to holiness while I separate from all of that I dedicate myself to what is holy, righteous, just, good, pure, all those things. Now, we're talking about God. I'm to be holy because God is holy. God is separated from everything that is a contradiction to who he is. God is separated from everything that is against these characteristics. So he is separated from that which is unholy. He is separated from that which changes. He is separated. You just go down the whole list. <clears throat> God is eternal. He's separated from that which is finite. God, God is not finite. He's infinite, okay? So God is holy. He's set apart from all that would be a contradiction to who and what he is in all of his characteristics. God is holy. <clears throat> God is righteous. For the Lord is righteous. He loves justice. Now I got a I got an arrow here. That arrow is crooked. And when somebody does something wrong, we call him a crook. The guy's a crook. Right? God is not crooked. God is righteous. He's straight as an arrow. He does everything always right. He can never, ever do a wrong. He is righteous. So it says in Timothy, Now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day. It's going to be... Perfectly righteous, holy, just, because he can do no other. Because he always acts in accordance to his characteristics, who he is. This is our God. This is our God. All right, he is righteous. Therefore, will not the judge of the earth do right? And the answer to that is, of course he will. That's a question asked by Abraham. It's a rhetorical question because he's saying, will not the righteous judge of the earth do right? No, he will. So, all right. How are we doing on these? We've got a lot of them going, don't we? A lot of characteristics. That, I'm not going to get them all. I'm not going to get them all. Characteristics of who God is. This is who He is. So, in Jeremiah it says, But the Lord is the true God. The psalm says, Redeem me, O Lord, the God of truth. There's two concepts here. True God, all right? I am true human. 
I know some of you think otherwise. <laughs> but I am a true human being. I, I'm genuinely human, and so he is genuinely, truly God. The other one expression here is the God of truth. I, and if I, I could say I'm a man of the truth, which would mean I'm telling the truth. And so because of who he is, <clears throat> he is true God, he tells the truth. There is no lie in him. I hope I have the other verse in here. No, I don't. But in Titus 1, 2, it says, In hope of eternal life, which God promised before the world began, and who cannot lie. He cannot lie. I love that verse. God cannot lie. I think it's Titus 1, 2. All right? Cannot lie. Therefore, to really know the truth, we really need to know God. To really know the truth, we really need to know God. We've got to think God's thoughts after Him. We agree with the world on a lot of things. All right. <clears throat> for for example, I got a cookie here, <clears throat> and uh, this cookie, uh, I say, well, there's one cookie here. Oh, now there's two cookies here, right? So one and one cookie make how many? Two. 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 All right. Now I I agree with that. So does my friend who doesn't believe in God. You know, he's an atheist, a classic, whatever. He doesn't believe in that. What I mean by that and what he means by that are two totally different things. My friend will say, oh, look, you got a chocolate chip cookie. Oh, those chocolate, that chocolate? That just happened random by chance. And you got it in the cocoa bean. They ground that up and they made chocolate out of it. And, oh, you got sugar, sugar cane. And you got the flour. All that came from the wheat of the field. But all those things that appeared here on earth by accident, uh, or maybe if you watch Ancient Aliens, some alien brought that seed here and planted it on Earth, and, you know. And, and, and so they got their interpretation of all that. And I say, oh, no, 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 no. That's God created chocolate. God created flour. God created sugar. And so I'm saying I got one God created cookie and another God created cookie makes two God created cookies. And they're saying, no, 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 those are two happen by chance evolutionary cookies. And so... Although we talk in forms and agree the same, what we mean by all of that is totally different. Totally different. Because I have a biblical, theological worldview that God, this eternal God, God I'm talking about with all these characteristics, He's the one that created this and made this. And for, so for me to really know the truth about cookies, I've got to know God. If I don't know God, I'm, I'm in the shadows, man. I'm, I'm in the darkness. I'm, I'm talking pretty much the same language, but I don't have a clue as to the reality of existence. To really know the truth, you've got to really know God. So we've got to come to know God. A person without God only has a shadow of reality, not the real, real world. The next one is God is faithful. <clears throat> God is faithful through whom you were called into fellowship with His Son, Jesus Christ. So I got old faithful here. He's, he's more reliable than old faithful. God is faithful. You can count on him. You can depend on him. Therefore, you can depend on him. That's that's. I want you to know you, you can depend on God. He is faithful. That's his characteristic. You might think that, that God, where are you? But God has a bigger plan. And uh, he's faithful to himself and to you. Of course, we all know this one, God is love. Who does not love, <clears throat> whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. It's kind of like the whole idea of the truth. You can't know the truth unless you really know God. You can't really know love unless you really know God. You may have a shadow of, of love, but real love, genuine love, you have to know God in order to know love. So then, really, to really know God, the love of God, I mean, to really know love, you must really know the God of love. You've got to know God. You say, well, I know some Christians that were not very lovely. Yep. I've known some lost people that seemed a lot lovelier. Yep. That doesn't mean the lost person <clears throat> knows God any better. It means the person who's a Christian, they're really not connected to the God of love. Because if we're really going to know love, we've got to know God. That's what the Word of God teaches. God is merciful. <clears throat> For the Lord your God is a merciful God. Be merciful just as your Father in heaven is merciful, or your Father is merciful. 
And mercy is divine pity. It's also withholding from a person what they deserve. I don't know if I have that on this. We'll talk about it later. But therefore, God has compassion on our human weaknesses. I like that one psalm that says, God knows the stuff we're made of. He knows I'm just dust. He knows that. He knows who I am. And he has compassion on my human weakness. Here, here's why God is gracious. We talked a lot about gracious, <clears throat> grace. But you, O oh Lord, are a compassionate, gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. God is a God who gives gifts. He's gracious. Therefore, God gives us what we do not deserve. God gives us what we do not deserve. In fact, that's what he did in Christ. We talked about that even this morning, God giving Jesus Christ, which we did not deserve. God is patient. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some men count slowness, but he is patient towards you, not willing for any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Uh, they were arguing, said, where is the where is this coming? It's been years since uh, you've been telling us the Lord is coming back, the Lord is coming back. Where is it? And, and, and they said, hey, he's not slow on his promise. Just be patient. He goes on the passage and says, a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. Because he does not reckon time like we do. He's not on our calendar. He's not on our 24-hour clock. Okay? So he said, he's just showing it as a comparison. He says, for us, a day is like a thousand years. So if you go by that reckoning, hey, Jesus has only been gone for two days. Two days. And that's just a, a metaphor, though. God is patient. He's patient. <clears throat> the result of that is God waits on us. That blows me away. He waits on me. He's patient with me. I don't seem to get it. I keep doing the same stupid things over. He's just so patient. It's like watching my grandson try to tie his shoe for the first time. And you go through it and he doesn't quite get it. He gets a little frustrated. You do it again. You do it again. God is patient with me in dealing with my life. He knows I'm just dust. And like I am with my grandson, I just wait there. Okay, hey, yep, you'll get it. Oh, yeah. Here, put your finger on it. I'll hold my finger there. God, God is our Father. I mean, he's like that. He's patient with us. He waits on us. And God is Trinity. He's three persons. Remember, intellect, emotion, and will. There's three sets of intellect, emotion, and will. Three persons in one being. And we're going to talk about that next. Okay. And we're going to just take a pause here because I got a couple of discussion questions. I think maybe just one. Of them. All right. Just get a little interaction from you. Is this mind-boggling? Is this great stuff? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our God is so. Why did He give us free will? And does He, because He gave us free will, and we might answer Him in all the wrong ways or whatever we decide we want to do, but does He know that we're going to answer Him all in the wrong ways at the same time? Absolutely. <laughs> I know. I mean, and I feel so bad for God. I mean, I've, I've prayed for God because I'm thinking He's got to be so disappointed in this whole universe in yeah. how everything has come across. But with everything as it is, we'll see this a little bit later in, in the lesson here, it has been ordained by God, but the outcome is ordained as well. And I think all of us here have at some point went to the end of the book. Revelation 20, 19, 20, 21, and you see, we win. he wins. And that's because he knows everything. Everything's been ordained. It's going to happen. And the free will is free from my perspective. But God who knows everything, he, he, he knows even what my free will is going to choose. Isn't that amazing? <clears throat> Wait, we're, in a few minutes, we're going to get into this. He even knows what is not but could be, but it won't be because he hasn't ordained it to be. <coughs> whoa, <is> whoa. <laughs> You're going to keep that three I will, a little bit later. <laughs> wow. <laughs> We, we put God, too often we put God in a box that I can put in my pocket. <laughs> and God cannot be contained. My God is so great. And when it makes no sense to me, somehow from his perspective, it makes wonderful sense. 
because he thinks bigger and I think what Jeremiah said his, his as heaven is higher than the earth so are his ways above my ways I just don't get it sometimes and he said don't worry I got it I got I got you covered here I got you covered it's like one day I was I was combing my hair and I looked in this the sink I was combing my hair over the sink and I thought about the scripture that says he knows every hair on my head at any moment and I thought about all the billions of people in the in the world, and God knows every single hair that you've lost or that comes in new. It's, it's, or it turns white. Or it turns white. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm watching the Science Channel, and they're trying to talking mathematics. Not that I'm a great mathematician, but they're talking. Is there a final end last number? Okay. And so they've been running a computer on this for years to get to a final last end number. Of course, there's no last number, because as soon as you get that, you just say, double it. <laughs> okay, no, God, God is like that to us. I don't care how big you think he is, God is even bigger. God is just even bigger, just greater in every respect than my mind can see. So some people, some theologians, just out of my notes here, they talk about the incomprehensibility of God. That God is incomprehensible. I cannot wrap my mind around the concept of God. And actually, so one of the questions is, if you don't fully know it, can you really know it? Then the answer is yes, you can. I don't fully know everything about President Trump, but can I know him? Yeah, I can know him. I could go meet him. I could actually shake his hand. But does that mean I know everything about him? No. I don't know what he did on his taxes the last 10, 20 years, nor do you. But do we know him? Yeah, we know him. And so we know God to the extent that he has revealed himself to us. In Deuteronomy 29, 29 says, the secret things belong to the Lord. No, it says, uh, oh, I can't remember that verse completely right now, but it's a paraphrase. Uh, secret things belong to the Lord, but the things I have revealed belong to you and to your, and to your children's generations forever. And so God is saying, you can't know everything about me. But everything I've re revealed about me is true. I'm truly God. And you can know me to the extent that you know who I am from what I've revealed to you. You can know God. This, is, this blows my mind. I mean, I, a little tiny creature, you know, in the vastness of the whole universe, on planet Earth, in Waterford, I can get on my knees and talk to the God who created it all. It, that blows my mind that he would even pay attention to me. Better than me. It's just awesome. If you had to describe to someone who had never heard of God, how would you describe him? This is hard. <clears throat> Insecure. Hmm? Insecure. 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 I'm not following you there. No, the characteristics. Oh, I'm sorry. The other question. Okay. If you had to describe to someone who had never heard of God, how would you describe? God to that person. Yeah. He knew the end from the beginning. End from the beginning. That's where he would start. Someone else. How would you describe God? Awesome. Awesome. Loving. <laughs> hmm? Loving Father. Loving Father. Okay, he would go the path of loving Father. Where else? What else might you say? Oh, the creator of all that is. The creator. Okay. Where? Who, what else might we say? You're going to describe to somebody who God is. Everywhere present. Okay. Everywhere present. Okay. All the, all, what you're doing is you're pulling these characteristics of God. He's the sum total of all the characteristics that he's revealed to us in the Bible. So I usually start out with God is spirit. He's in, <coughs> invisible. He's alive. He's got intellect, emotion, and will. He's a person. And he wants a relationship with us. And then I take him to Jesus because Jesus is the one who is bridges my fallen state with him. All right. What characteristic of God puts you in puts fear in your heart? That he knows everything. That he knows everything. <laughs> we all like to hide a few things about ourselves, don't we? Righteous. That he's righteous. What else? Puts a fear in you. Remember the famous sermon uh, by Jonathan Edwards? Sinners in the hands of a angry God. Ooh. brought about a great awakening here in America that God is righteous, just, holy 
And uh, when he says uh, there's going to be consequences for what we've done wrong, yeah, there's characteristics of God. You know, it, my dad, my dad, I had the greatest dad on the planet Earth. Well, when I misbehaved and the news got home, got home, and my my dad knew about it, uh, as much as my love my dad, I was in a terrible fear of my father. And he'd say, "Go down to the basement and wait for me." And man, you'd be just down there trembling till till he came down. And when he came down with the board, we got our little whacking. Yeah, he wasn't like my mom. The louder you yelled, the less he she she spanked. My dad, you yelled. He just laid it on and said, "I know you're." I know what you're doing here. And so I get my, my spank and say, see, there is an aspect that we fear. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of all knowledge. Okay? I fear. And, and there's not being afraid of God. It's reverencing God. I feared my father. I reverenced him. Because as compassionate as he was, my father was just. And he, if, if I... You know... You, you could do just about anything. My dad was a very, very patient man. He was like God, very patient. But there's one thing you didn't do. You did not talk back to my mom. Man, if you talk back to my mom, you were in big trouble because that was like the sin of all sins in our house. You don't talk back to the woman he married. You know? And so the fear. I can love somebody and be fearful at the same time. That's all I'm trying to say. Uh, what characteristic of God draws you closest to him? Merciful. He's merciful. What else? Forgiving. Forgiving. Yeah. Forgiving. Compassionate. Compassionate. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Okay, because he's there. He exists. Yes. What else? I go back to a loving God. Loving God. The love of God. Oh man, that's just that's powerful. Well, these these are all good. Anybody need to take a break? Going once. Going twice. <laughs> Break time's over. I have a question. Got a question? Okay, we got a question. I like this. When you said God is everywhere, and then you said he was in hell. Yes. Okay. But then you went on to say that when he's holy, he doesn't um, he doesn't put himself in places with people that aren't like him. He is everywhere, even when there's evil taking place, he's there. He's there, but how does he exist in hell? I do not know, but that's what Psalm 139 says. That uh, I cannot escape his presence. If there is a created place, he is there. Because he supersedes all space. It's not saying that uh, see, he is invisible, immaterial, and, and that's a created place. He, he supersedes, he's there, but it doesn't mean that he's lounging around there. It's just you cannot escape his presence no matter where you go. He is there. He is there. So he even knows what's going on in hell. He knows what's going on in hell. He's very irritated the ones that didn't accept it. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, he's there as spirit, now. You've got to remember, like, he is here as spirit, and we don't see him. He is there in spirit, and they don't see him either. He's there as spirit, okay? Immaterial. He's there. I want to go to, uh, 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 staying on this who is God, but I want to dig deeper into one characteristic of God that is just hard for us to wrap our heads around. And that one area is, as so far we've looked at uh, God's primary characteristics, and in order to understand who He is, and two characteristics see contradictory. The one that God is one, and that God is triune. God is one, and that He is three. And so I want to I want to wrestle with this and uh, talk about. It. Let's see what the scriptures say about it. First of all, Scripture affirms both the oneness of God's being. I see that and the threeness of God's person. Now, you might want to circle the word being and person, because there's a huge difference between these two. Being is your state of existence. God is spirit, he exists as a spirit, so he's one spirit. But his threeness is in his person. I have one body, okay? And I have one spirit, and my spirit, my one body, coincide with each other. In God there is one being, but he has three persons, three different intellectual intellects, emotions, and wills that occupy that same single one being. That's hard to put your head around. Yeah. Okay. Is that a little confusing? Mm -hmm. We'll keep going. All right. Here's what I want you to see. The scripture says that talks about the oneness of God. 
The Lord our God is the Lord is one. He's one. There is no God but one, first Corinthians eight. James two nineteen. You believe that there is one God, good, because that's the truth. There is one God. The Bible also says that there are no plurality of gods. You shall have no other gods, smaller g, before me. Those are no gods. He says, I am the first and I am the last. Apart from me, there is no God. So there is only one God. So Allah is not God. Buddha is not God. Okay, you go down any the list. There's only one God. He's declared himself to be Jehovah, Yahweh. All right? And so there's just one God. There's not a plurality of gods. There's just one true God. There are three different persons that are called that same one God. This is where it gets confused. The Father is called that same one Spirit, God. In 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came. So the Father is God. This person called the Father, He is God. We go a little bit further. And the Son is called God. All we have to do is Genesis chapter, <clears throat> John chapter 1, verse 1. We've covered this several times. In the beginning was the Word, capital W, because that's the name for Jesus Christ in His preexistent state before He became the very first Christmas. And the Word, that's His name, the second person of Trinity, was with God, and the Word was God. With God, face to face, and the Word was God. Wow, this is so cool. So you got this person that's the Father who is God. You've got this person who is the Son or the Word who is God. All right, we come to the third one. Oh, there's more verses on the Son being God. I and my Father are one. Christ said, who is God? Referring to Christ. Christ, who is God overall forever praised. The Son is God. So the Son is called God several places in the Bible. For in Christ all the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. He is God in the flesh. So we have all these verses. Now, there's a third member of the Godhead. The Holy Spirit is called God. In Acts chapter 5, verse 3, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And the next verse says, you have not lied to men, but you have lied to God. So a God, the Holy Spirit is God as well. There's three persons that are all called God. In 1 Corinthians 2.11, it says, no one knows the thought of thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. So here's the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Now, each of the three persons are distinct from each other, and we see that in a passage like Matthew chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. At the time of Jesus being baptized, all right, when Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. So you got Jesus present, who's God in the flesh. John the Baptist saw a dove. He saw the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. It doesn't say it was a dove. It says the Holy Spirit was descending as a dove. And at the same time, there's a voice from heaven, which is the Father saying, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. So we have an incident right here where all three members of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are all God, are surfacing as three distinct persons in, in this event, in the, in the activity. Does that make sense? All right. <clears throat> the three persons are identified as the same entity in Matthew 28, 19, and 20, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So there's three titles given to the one name. This is very interesting. We would have expected to say, oh, you, you violated grammar in the names of, but it doesn't have an S, it's one name. Because in the Semitic concept of the name, the name means more than just a title. My name is Dennis. That is my title. I've gone by that handle my whole life. All right, Dennis, Dennis. Now, <clears throat> it's singular because I'm one person. It represents who I am, but in the Semitic concept, it also represents what you do. What you do. Who I am and what I do. Now, some people have a name like Smith, right? And it probably came from at one point they were a blacksmith they were a smith or some of them have titles that are like that <clears throat> because it represents not just your name but what you do and that's what the concept here the semitic name in the name of the father son and holy spirit what he's saying in, in the person and work of the three people persons father son and holy spirit 
I don't know if that helps you at all. One name, three persons. Identified as the same single name or entity. That's what we have going on there. Now here's what I, I got a little diagram. I just try to illustrate what's going on here. God is spirit. So God is one. I got one God here. I, I don't know how to do this. I can't put God in a triangle. I know that, but let that represent God. We know that the Bible says the Father is God. We know that the Bible says the Son is that same God. They're both the same. It says that the Holy Spirit is that same God. So all three are the same God. And at the same time, the Bible never confuses that the Father is not the Son and the Father is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Son, nor is the Spirit the Father. The Son is not the Father or, nor the Spirit. Because they're three distinct persons, but all three of those persons are the one and the same God. The well, one and the same God. The egg theory. Hmm? The egg theory. Kind of, sort of. Yeah. It's not modalism. There's a doctrine that's called modalism. And by that they say, well, you see, God in the Old Testament was the Father, and He's mean and He's vengeful, and He's trying to wipe out everybody. But in the New Testament, God comes as the Son, and He's loving. Oh, He loves people, you know, and, and, and all of that. And then, oh, then, then God of the New Testament, the book of Acts, and on, when the Holy Spirit came, God is here now in spirit. So they think that there's three different modes of the one God. He showed up as the Father. Oh, then he showed up as the Son. He's no longer the Father. He shows up as the Son. Oh, then he's no longer the Son. He shows up as the Spirit. That's not what the Bible's teaching. That's called modalism. It's not that. He's, he's not three different phases of God because they're all three the, the same God at the same time. Not tritheism. We do not have three gods. We don't have three gods. We only have one God. Here's a statement on the Trinity. This is my definition. Not that I didn't beg, borrow, and steal from everybody else. Within the one essence, that spirit being of God, there are three distinct persons who are called coexistent. All three of them existed coexistently. You realize a father becomes a father at the same time that a son becomes a son. So the father was not around before the son. Not, not, we're talking relationship here. That's, these are relationship terms. So they were all coexistent, co-equal, and they're all co-eternal. Whoa, that's mind-boggling. And they always work in harmony. This one essence or spirit being, essence is just an invisible material thing, and we call it spirit, one essence cannot be divided or multiplied to become three essences. No. Nope. Nor can the three persons be merged to make God one person. It is God is three persons in one essence. He's three persons in one spirit being. I do have, this is the way it is, just like the chart. All three are not each other but they are all one, the same spirit God. Now, I want to try illustrating this in a different way. you got to think abstractly with me. Three persons. <clears throat> I'm going to pick on three right here. Myself, my brother, <laughs> and my brother. We're three, different, we're three different people. All right? I have intellect, emotion, and will. Intellect, emotion, and will. Intellect, emotion, and will. We just so happen to be in three bodies. But imagine that somehow I could invite these two guys to come into me. <laughs> now I got three intellects, emotion, and will in the same body. All right? That would be like the Trinity, but not a Trinity in spirit, but Trinity in a body, right? So there'd be three of us. But in the Trinity, each intellect, emotion, and will, will can do whatever it wants. So we've got three of us, we're all in the same body. And I decide, you know what, I'm getting tired of this. I'm just going to go home and take a nap. But Al, who's also in the same body, says, no, no, no. I'm going to go work in the yard. It's a beautiful day. I'm not going to have too many more of these. And, and then Mel says, oh, no, no, hey, you guys, I'm going to the golf course. <laughs> all right? I'm going to take care of everything. And so all three of us use the same body. What would happen to this body? It'd get ripped all apart. But God 
is three persons, intellect, emotions, and will, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, using the same spirit, because it's everywhere present in its totality, okay? They're all utilizing it at the same time in their own unique individual way. This blows us away because there's nothing on earth like him. That's why he's called unique, one of a kind. There's no other like him. That's our God. All right? One body, all in one mind, my one body, trying to do everything. I would be a finite trinity if we could do that. And God is the actual trinity. There's nothing like him in creation to compare him to. Each person of the trinity has a role in creation. All right, how are we doing on that? Each one has a role in creation. The Father is the source of creation, according to 1 Corinthians 8, 6. He's the divine planner. The Son is the agent. He's the one that actually does it. And the Holy Spirit is the energizer. He hovers over the face of the deep. All three have part in it. Now, Theologians speak of two kinds of trinity. Ontological means in being, and economic, which means in the way we're going to operate. So the Father chose, they all work together in an eternal council, that the Father would be the one who makes the plan, the Son would be the one who would actually activate it and do it, and the Holy Spirit would energize it. They all three, all three members of the Godhead had a part in creation. Economically, they're all co-equal, co-eternal, there's no being subject one to another. Now, each person has a role in the redemption cycle. The Father chose you. That's repeated in the Bible. He chose you. He chooses. He chooses. The Son died for you. The Father did not die for you. The Son died for you. It was the Son who united His deity with our humanity. Not the Father, not the Holy Spirit. It was the Son. And He died for you. The Father chose you, the Son died for you. The Holy Spirit is the one who infuses the benefits of Jesus Christ into your life when you believe. That's called regeneration. He gives us new life. All three members of the Godhead are involved in your salvation. They're all equal, but to work out the plan, there was an agreement between the Father that He would be the chooser, the Son. He said, oh, I volunteer, I'll die for Him. And the Holy Spirit says, I'll apply it to their lives. And so there is a harmony and unity. There's an economy that they worked out back in eternity past in order to bring about our salvation. The Bible gets kind of deep, doesn't it? Yeah, on the surface it seems like, oh, there's not much there, but boy, it sure is deep. God is triune. Okay, there's three persons and one being. Therefore, there's no contradiction in his character because there is none like him. I am God, there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. That's why we have a hard time comparing him to anything, because there's really no comparison. There's no, nothing like him anywhere. God is unique. So if someone were to ask you to explain the Trinity, how would you go about it? Just what you said. <laughs> my brother had to, my brother had to, had the Jehovah's Witnesses knock on the door and, my, and, and he said, "Oh, I said, you know, it's too bad my brother's not here because he could tell you a thing or two." <laughs> my brother wasn't going to handle it. One day they came to my house. They come to my house, and this one I was out in Ohio, I lived in Ohio, and uh, I stepped out on the porch and I'm talking with them and. And I'm pulling out your Bible, we're looking at verses, and, and a little later, I mean, they left, and then a little later, my car wouldn't start. And I went over to my neighbor and said, hey, man, my, I need a jump. Could you give me a jump? He said, oh, yeah, I'd be glad to. He said, you know, I heard your sermon on the lawn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's very hard to explain, all right, because we, immediately we want to think in, in our finite, limited human terms. Three people or three individual people. But, you know, three persons. But in the Godhead, one essence with three persons. You know what? God was never lonely. The Father had the Son, the Son had the Father and the Holy Spirit. They were never lonely. So the, God didn't need us because He needed companionship. 
He created us because He wanted to create us to have more companionship. God is not needy. So all these things begin to surface when you when you get start to wrap your head around it. All right, I got to move on. Anybody need a break? We got a question still. Okay, you said that God chose us. Yes. Not everybody believes that. Not every faith believes that. Well, everybody who believes the Bible believes that God chose. And because it says multiple times in the Bible, we'll cover some of those that God chose. In fact, that, we're going to cover that in a minute here. <clears throat> Not everyone believes that He chose us based on His own on His own knowledge. That, uh, but they believe that, like I was explaining. You look down through tunnel time. So, oh, they chose me, so I'll choose them. Okay, and so they have it as a reciprocal choice. Whereas I don't believe it's that way at all. But then, like he said, so what about the? Uh God chose us before even the foundations of the earth. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Absolutely. Because I know evangelicals that don't believe that. So one of our good friends doesn't believe that. That God chose? I'll bet they do. They would just use, they would uh, not say, they would say that we chose him first and then he chose us, is what they would say. But then people I talk to, they say, well, why bother uh, if God knows us? If he chose us, mm -hmm. he's going to know who's going to be called, so why should I even bother? Uh, if he mm -hmm. wants me, then he'll choose, you know. How did he get around that? You... Well, I quote, and then uh, I think it's 2 Timothy 1.10, where the 2.10, where the Apostle Paul says, I endure all things for the elect's sake, oh, those chosen ones say, that they may obtain the same salvation with eternal glory. He says, I'm putting up with all this because I know God has people out there who are chosen unto salvation. I don't know who they are, but God knows who they are. So I preach to everyone so that those that are chosen of the Lord can respond. What, what do you say about the, the chosen ones as the Jews? And that, they, and that uh, it wasn't until Christ was revealed or died for us. I mean, that made us allowed to choose Christ as our Savior. So. That is true. And he chose the Jewish people to be the, the line of redemption. But the Jew still has to be one of the chosen to receive Christ as a Savior in order to be saved. Now our day is coming when the number of people in the church will be filled, the church will be raptured, and God is going to deal once again with His chosen people, Israel. And so according to Romans chapter 11, there were a branch broke off of the blessing of God, and then the message is going to the Gentiles, but that branch can be regrafted back into the blessing of God, which will take place in the future. Yeah. That's, he, he's revealed that plan. It was his choice to do it that way. And so, okay? These are good questions. I have a question. Yeah. All right. Um, God's eternity, aren't, we were made in his image, and aren't we also body, soul, and spirit? Or man is a trinity? Well, yeah, but man has more parts than that. Okay? Because the Bible talks about more than just body, soul, and spirit. It talks about bowels of compassion. It talks about a heart. It talks about all that. So I don't compare those two. A lot of people do. I'm not saying that they don't. They don't. Uh, and then the question becomes, what's the difference between soul and spirit? And we'll talk about that when we get to the digging deeper into man, what man, how God made man and all that. That's the lessons ahead. But, uh, man, man is like God. Uh, when God, God made man in his own image, I think there's also an element that he made man a duality because he created man Male and female created he them. So there is a duality. We're all humanity, but there's a duality, male and female, that corresponds to the Trinity, that there is one God, but there's a threeness in person. So there's there's a little play there also going on in Genesis chapter one. Good questions. <clears throat> all right. Oh yeah, I got that. <laughs> Plenty of time. Yeah. I want to talk about the works of God. And I'm only going to deal with a full, fourfold works of God. <clears throat> We've already been starting to talk about the first one. It's called the decree of God. You can also put with that the plan of God. God has a plan. Theologians have called that a decree. But he, is, he planned and decreed to happen. Like in the Old Testament, the king made a decree. This is what's going to happen. This is what we're going to do. The second one is God's creation. That's a work of God. The third one is God's providence. I want to talk about the providence of God. 
And then the fourth work of God, we're going to talk about salvation, the salvation of God. So we've got these four works of God that I want to focus on the remaining time here. The decree, creation, providence, and salvation. Let's look at the decree first. <clears throat> God's decree, you might put slash his plan, um, because God's decree is the fact that he has an eternal plan by which he has rendered certain every actual and probable event, both in time and eternity. God has a plan. And so here I got like, for creation I use the earth. God's got a blueprint that he's doing everything by. Everything that is, is going on is according to God's eternal plan. And that's, he's got this eternal decree. <clears throat> Here's the fact of his decree. And there's other verses we could have picked, but I picked this one from Ephesians 1.11. Having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. He's predestined a plan of everything. To predestine means to beforehand make the destiny. So he has marked out the destiny of everything beforehand, but he's got a plan by which he's working it to that end destiny, and this is an eternal plan. Uh, and it says, according, he worked out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. King James says uh, uh, he's worked all things after the counsel of his will. And the word really there is counsel. It's uh, where like the members of the Godhead in eternity uh, planned how everything is going to happen and nothing is happening outside of that. That's just mind blowing. Nothing is outside God's plan. Nothing. The scope of his plan is global. In Isaiah 14, 26, this is the plan determined for the whole world. The whole world. I know some people think that it was the end of the world when Donald Trump was elected. It was in the plan. <laughs> Even September 11th. Even September 11th was in the plan. The rise of Hitler was in the plan. There is nothing outside this plan. I'm telling you, God has decreed the whole world. That's the mind That's the mind. Well, you guys are jumping to the... Okay. <laughs> in Romans 9 in Romans 9 he talks about the goodness and the severity of God if there were no evil there were no sin now I'm just going to summarize it in later time we'll, we'll expand on it if there were no evil there were no sin God could never demonstrate his grace could never demonstrate his grace grace is giving you what you don't deserve if there was never sin or evil that he could never demonstrate that he is a gracious God to pardon and forgive sin. He could never demonstrate his justice in giving a guilty person the deserved wrath they deserve. So God got this infinite plan where all of his attributes bring glory to him. When someone is judged for all eternity, it's going to glorify God. And when some of us who know Jesus as our Savior, we're in heaven with Him for all eternity, it's going to glorify God. Everything is going to bring glory to God. God is so awesome. And the unveiling of the whole picture in the book, I tried to jump to the end there, God has a grander purpose than just the time I live in. He's got the purpose of all eternity, a bigger scope, where it's all going to work together. Everything, everything's going to work together for good. All right. But coming back to this, the whole world, this, it, it says, this uh, is the hand stretched out over all nations. It includes every nation. The Lord Almighty, see all of his might, has purposed. He's determined it. And who can thwart him? Oh, my goodness. In Romans chapter 9, he says, How can that which is created say to the Creator, Why did you make me the way you made me? The Creator can make whatever He wants. His hand stretched out. Who can turn it back? You can't. God has this huge overarching uh, plan. Mind boggling. It's over national elements. He determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Anybody memorize that verse this year? I did. Yeah. That was one of our memory verses. Uh, February. 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 God determined the time set for them. 
There's no mistake that I'm living in the 21st century. We watched this movie last night about the Romans. I, I love I'm so intrigued about the Roman Empire. God made no mistake put me in the American Empire. <laughs> I'm here. That I'm in Waterford. That I'm teaching class today. This was determined in eternity past in the mind of my God. Oh my goodness. Every detail. The exact places where they should live and even how they should live. The scope of his, his decree. Every human element. Man's days are determined. You have decreed the number of his months and have set the limits he cannot exceed. <laughs> this is my book. You know, I really don't have to fear about anything because my, my date of my departure has already been set. I'm not going to add one day to my life. Jesus picks up on that and says, by all your worrying, are you going to add a single day to your life? No. And James says, it's appointed unto man wants to die. So I really don't have to limit my sugar. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, it also says the Lord takes no pleasure in a fool. <laughs> Okay, is it possible for us to shorten yes. our life beyond the, the plan that God has for us? The years no. that God has for So if somebody gets up and says, Listen, I just can't take it anymore, that's how they got to shoot themselves and they die. Even that was in the plan. Uh, no, Didn't God extend the life on a person? And the person who, hey, we go through everything. You go through, my, my mom went through. Uh, the radiation and chemo, I, I swear I'll never do what she did because it was so, so painful to watch her and to see her pain. Uh, she maybe thought she extended her life another six months. That was in the plan. It was only going to be that six months. So even the people who are falsely imprisoned for something they didn't do. It was in the plan. Hey, listen. The Apostle Paul was thrown in prison for being, he was falsely charged. He was in prison. And rather than view that as outside the plan, he said, oh, God planned me to be in here. There must be somebody in here that I should share my faith with. Because it was in the plan. Wow, this is mind-blowing. You realize for a Christian who grabs hold of this whole idea of God being sovereign and Lord of all, that there are no accidents. No accidents. All divine appointments. It's actually free. It's very free. Did you don't have to worry about it. Car accidents, everything that goes Everything was in the plan. Part of his plan. He says he works everything together for good. Now, I don't always see the good in it in my time, but there will be an ultimate good. There's not a thing that, that happens that for the Christian, he is not going to orchestrate that for good. All right. And Every, it might not even be for our good. It might not be, be for our somebody good. else's. I, I find it very interesting. The Bible says that Jesus learned obedience through suffering. We view suffering as a terrible evil, and the Bible does not view it that way. It views suffering as a good. When you view it against eternity, what does it mean? Hmm? When you view today, this Pardon life, me? against eternity, what does, it, what does it mean? It doesn't mean much. And this is for Christians and non-Christians. For everyone. He's in control of everything. Let's see what my next one is. Oh, this is what we're going to talk about earlier. The scope of his plan is probable elements. I don't think I can repeat it the way I did earlier. <laughs> but in Luke 19, 39, some of the Pharisees of the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, Jesus replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Hear the children sing, Hosanna, all right? Triumphal entry. Palm Sunday. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lord the highest. And Pharisees go, hey, tell them, tell them, stop saying that. And Jesus said, I tell you, if they keep quiet because Hosanna has to come out, the stones will cry out. It's like there was a plan B, but plan B was only going to be plan B. It was a possibility, but not an actuality, because the actuality was that the children would cry out. But it was determined that it would just be a probability that the stones could cry out. And it was only determined to be a probability so Jesus could say, if you don't, they will. But they did, so they stones don't. This is, it takes into account 
what the probable could be, but will never be. Isn't that amazing? God's, God's had this thing all planned out. I don't know about you, but that's reassuring that there's everything, everything, everything God is in control of. There's nothing outside his control. Spiritual elements. For he chose us and him before the creation of the world. That's what Alan said a few moments ago. God chose you, if you're a Christian, before the creation of the world. Listen to this. In the book of Revelation, it calls Jesus the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He chose us. Christ was already in the plan of God to be crucified. It took place in AD 32. But in God's mind, it was rendered certain a long time ago, just like choosing us. It was rendered certain a long time ago. I say I got saved when I was eight years old. The truth is I got saved in eternity past. When God chose me, Christ the Redeemer was already in a plan to die for me. My sins have already been paid for. It was just in, in, in God's eternal plan that uh, on August 2nd, there in 1960, I would accept Jesus at the campfire with Camp Green and with the Bible open to John 3.16 and the Holy Spirit would then infuse life within me in real time. People say, when did you get saved? Well, that's a hard one to answer. Eternity passed. July, August you know, 30th. Uh, and I'm going to be saved in the future. When Christ returns, He's saving me from all the evilness where I'm going to go to heaven and never participate in sin again. Whoa, that's a hard one to really answer. But He chose us. He chose us. I mean, we can't get around that. The Bible says it several places. Look at this one. Second Thessalonians, I really like this passage. Because from the beginning, God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying, that setting apart. God, the Holy Spirit set me apart for salvation through the setting apart work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. I was set apart. God saved me. He chose me to be saved. And He used the sanctifying work of the Spirit, but also that I would believe in the truths. So I, I'm not saved without believing. But it was planned that I would believe. And that I would do it of my own free will. He didn't twist my arm. But it was in the plan. This is my I, I There's no way that this human accountability and the divine sovereignty. So free will means No, no, free will means everything. Every single place in the Bible. Every single place in the Bible where it says that God chose you. And one verse, the next verse says, but you've got to believe. In Romans chapter 9, God chose us. It's all the work of God's grace. In Romans chapter 10, so if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you will be saved. The Bible lives in the Middle Eastern mind, does this too. They live in tension. They, it's not either or. we got this either or going. They have both and. God chose me, and I'm saved. Ah! But unless you believe, you're not saved. I believe. Who believed? I did. I did that. I placed my faith. But that was in the plan. It was in the plan. It's my Bible. So there are some people that aren't chosen. There are people who are not chosen. This is deep. This is very deep. There are people who are not chosen. Yeah. Will they ever enter? Pardon? Those that are not chosen will, will they ever enter? Will what do you mean enter? Enter in his eternity. Enter his this house no if they're not chosen then they are <coughs> this this sorry let me there's a theological order to all this and there's different different theologians take different approaches the first item that most most theologians say is God decreed to create not all some take the order differently we're just talking logical order because there's no timely element because everything with God was immediate always always happened God created then he decreed to permit the fall most of us think that people are innocent but they're not all have sinned and fall short of glory of God the consequent consequences of sin the wage of sin is death so when God created you know theologically it in the mind of God, the first thing was, I'm going to create. I'm going to allow them to fall into sin. I'm going to permit that. Then I'm going to decree that I'm going to choose some out of that fallen humanity, because you don't have to choose them if they're not fallen, to be saved, because they don't have to be rescued from anything. So this is all logical. Then there was a decree to provide the salvation for those he had chosen. So then he actually sent Jesus Christ into the world to die for them, 
And then the next one is a decree to apply that salvation that Christ has to those that he had chosen, but fallen, that he had created. Does this make sense? This is called the logical order of salvation from the perspective of God's decree. Some of them change the order here, but all theologians have to wrestle with, how do I reconcile the fact that God is sovereign, never learned anything, never discovered anything, uh, always knew everything, that he is the one who chose from a fallen humanity to be saved, how do I, how do I integrate and interrelate this whole thing? Now, we have a hard time with that because we're finite. But in God, he's not finite, so he has, has no problem with this. And I just try to pull this all together in logical order based upon what the scriptures are telling me to come up with a theology, that's what theologians do, they're ordering it, to try to make sense out of these two that seem to be in conflict. God's sovereignty, my responsibility which the scriptures affirm both. I don't deny them. I just try to make the best sense out of these that I can. Does that make sense? And my head's exploding. Yes. <laughs> it, 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 it takes faith because it's too hard to understand sometimes. I mean, when you really think of the concept of God's sovereignty and that we're chosen, but a lot of us are praying for our children. Absolutely. We have to, we have to believe that they might not be chosen. You know what I mean? And, but I keep praying for them because, well, as, hope, because like you said, the elect, if they're there, you want to still make it open to them so that they come to the saving grace and acceptance of Jesus. But, boy, that is, it's hard to think that our God would do that. That's what it's hard for me to think, that our God would do that. Choose some and not others. But I know it's true because the Bible says it's mm -hmm. true. He talks about elections. But we're looking at it from the perspective that... Of human beings. Yeah. We're looking at it, we're all fallen and every single one of us deserves eternal death, hell, and damnation. But God is gracious to save any. He could have saved one. He could have saved all. Why he only chose the one he chose and didn't choose all, I do not know. See, I was, I was always falsely going under the fact that Basically, everybody is chosen, but there's all those that will choose not to accept being chosen. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure you'll find any biblical support yeah. for that notion. Yeah, I'm getting to say that. That scares yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I was about the age of accountability, if there's such a thing, or like my, the, the child that my, mother, that my mother lost before he even had a chance to get going. How does that come into play it's so far? So. Right. They are. The age of accountability is <laughs> I love that for everybody. <laughs> the age of account accountability is uh, something we have made. You don't find those terms in the Bible. And so we have to ask ourselves then, what is the age of accountability? Now we get this whole concept of age of accountability from when the Israelites went in to conquer the uh, were supposed to come back with a report on spying out the land. Everyone that was of military age and upward were accountable, and those who were, were not of military age and below were not accountable for the action of the, what the nation chose in refusing to go in and conquer the land. Anybody know what the age was? 12. 20. 20. <laughs> All right. So that makes a, a good question. Is there an age of accountability for children that uh, if you're under that age, you're automatically saved? And uh, so, I am not one who believes in the age of accountability. Because at what age is it? Who determines that age? All right. <clears throat> Furthermore, I know this. Uh, I know from John the Baptist was full of the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. You get the Holy Spirit when you're one of the people of God. So from the very womb, he was already filled with the Holy Spirit, which meant somehow God did a saving work on him in the womb to receive the Holy Spirit so that at, at a, whatever age he came to understand, he believed. So I'm not, sure, I'm not sure what the data I have that I can concretely say that there is an age of accountability. 
I do know that God has this worked out and I don't have to have it worked out. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Moving down to your next scripture then. Yeah. He has a plan for you. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. Yeah. Then are you supposed to add to those that he chooses? Who's the you he's talking to? So the question everyone. becomes who's one? Huh? Everyone. Well, no, there he's talking to Israel primarily in the context. His people, they're being carried away into okay. captivity. And he's saying to the Jewish people, even though you're being carried away into captivity, I still have a plan for you. Uh, not for He's talking about his his people. All right? And so we always got to look at the context when we grab this. So I can say this clearly, that God has a plan for his people. Plans not to harm you. Uh, plans to bring calamity, but plans to prosper you or give you have, have welfare for a future and a hope. We who are Christians... No matter what happens, what a calamity, he has a plan for us. He's going to use that for, for good. He's, I don't think he's talking using this verse to talk about the Babylonians or the Edomites or he's talking about he's talking about his people. I know the plans I have for you, for you. Because there's always a difference between those who know the Lord and those who don't. And so the future and the hope is eternity. Well, in this passage, the immediate context, the future and the hope was being returned back to the land because they just went into captivity. On an application it is, God has a plan for us. Somewhere in the future, he is going to bless us. That's the application, because God wants us to apply the scriptures, but within the context, not to, we gotta know who the you is. We gotta know who the you is. You know, Pastor, I've often thought in this life, those that go through this life and reject God in eternity, what, what would, we wouldn't, what would they do? I mean, what would they, wouldn't that be hell to them to be in God's kingdom if they rejected it? Oh, life? if they were in God's kingdom right. and they had rejected it, would that, yeah, that's a that possible probability. Yeah. It's a hypothetical that I don't think will ever happen. Yeah. yeah. But for people that reject God, they're going to go to hell. Absolutely. But that, that's, a, that's an answer to them. That's an answer to those that, that but reject about God in this life. Day? Pardon? What about the stillborn child? Well, that's where I also I come back to the whole idea that John the Baptist, okay, he obviously was chosen before he was born to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And so I do know that if John the Baptist had been one of those who were aborted because he had been filled with the Spirit, would have arrived into heaven. Now, how God works all the details of that out, I'm not sure. But I know from that passage that there is hope. But I can't say that every single child was filled with the Holy Spirit. That'd be, that'd be way way too far out for me to say say that. Okay. All right. I could pick up next time on this spot, or we can continue on. Keep going. Keep going. All right. I want to talk about, that's God's decree. He's got a plan for everything. So obviously, if he had a plan for everything uh, that he created, okay? Everlasting God, uh, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, who does not become weary or tired. God created. And that, that's what I want to focus on. God's creation is his free act by which, in the beginning, through his divine energy, he brought forth out of nothing. That's what ex nihilo is the Latin. He brought forth out of nothing. He created everything that it is out of nothing. The entire universe, both visible and invisible, according to his eternal plan. God is the creator. No, I God is the creator. Not too long ago in uh, Area 51, I did a lesson on, I had some questions where they had to give their answers, and I was alarmed that nearly all of them believed that God created through evolution. That just shocked me, that God created through evolution. Anyway, what they're being taught. yeah. The first one, in fact, I got here is a cosmic creation, the fact of creation. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God created them. They didn't evolve. God created out of nothing, boom, everything that exists. I believe it was a six solar day achievement. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. Evening and morning the second day. Evening and morning the third day. He said, why evening and morning? That's the way the Hebrews reckon time. Their day begins at the evening and goes all the way through the 
evening of the next day. So it's dark night before day, night before day. And uh, we got concepts like in the Bible, the day of the Lord is a period of time, not a single day. And it's a period of night or darkness of the great tribulation and then of light of the millennial kingdom. And it's very interesting. They, the scriptures carry this through all, almost all the way through night and day. <clears throat> it did not evolve or take eons to do. There is a view that uh, the days are actually ages. Uh, that's called day age theory. I don't buy that at all. I think there were six solar days, evening, morning. God did what he did on the first day, second day, third day. The fact of a man's creation, mankind is created. Then God said, let us, the Trinity, okay, us, make man in our, the Trinity's image, according to our Trinity likeness. And God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female. So there's duality and humanity as there is this a Trinity in the Godhead. There's a duality, Trinity. There's, there's this image of God. Image of God will pick up with that under the doctrine of mankind being created later. The next chapter in chapter 2 of Genesis, it says, Then the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. So God created man. I believe he did make man from the dust, infused that, that dust with, with a breath of life, and man became a living soul, nephesh. He became alive. So, fact of creation. Here's two thoughts about this. Mankind was created immediately by God. There's no evolution from other lower species involved at all. So we call that an immediate creation. God created mankind in his own image. So we reflect the image of God. I want you to think about this for a moment. In Psalm 139, 13. For you were you created my inmost being. Alright, my existence, my soul. You knit me together in my mother's womb. That's my body. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Everything about me. Everything about me. The color of my eyes, the pigment on my skin, my height. Uh, everything about me was recorded before I ever came about. Because God is the creator. When you start to put all this together, you realize that God is just so big. And we are just so so finite. I want to turn my attention now. That was his work on creation, the work of creation. I'm looking at God's providence. In Hebrews 1.3, it tells us after, you know, all, we, we talked about God spoke through the prophets, all that. In verse 3, it says, God upholds all things by the word of his power. God upholds all things. He is operating his universe. So as I got here, he's carrying everything along. Watch, I'm showing you here. He's carrying everything along, the whole world. God's providence is the continued exercise of divine energy. It was divine energy that created this world. Boom, it was there. But the same energy that God created it, he continues to exercise by which this world was sustained, he carries it to its intended goal. God did not make the clock, wind it up, and let it go. He didn't create the world, wind it up, and just say, okay, you're on your own. I'll check back you know, in a couple thousand years, see how you're doing. <coughs> God is still, all of his energy is still going into his creation, upholding and sustaining it, taking it to its intended end. <coughs> He upholds everything. In Ephesians 1 it says, Having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity to the purpose of his will, to that divine plan. He's working out everything. Now, I've, I've said this before, and I, it's just a reminder. I'm going to do this. Watch. This is, this is scientific stuff here. Why did my keys come down? Gravity. The law of Gravity. What if I were to tell you you're wrong? What if I were to tell you you're wrong? Okay. You know why they came down? 
Because that's the way God operates his universe. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. In Kings, the axe head, okay, it was a metal axe head. Instead of floating, instead of sinking in the water, it floated. So sometimes God operates his universe in an extraordinary way. So that what usually comes out stays up. All right? Normally, when a person dies, they stay dead. But Jesus raised the daughter of uh, the, 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 the soldier. Hmm? The soldier. Yeah, I uh, can't think of the name. All right. Raised the Lord Jesus Christ from the dead. Paul raised the guy that fell out of the window because he preached till midnight. Fell out and de died. Eutychus. And he, he raised him from the dead. Normally, you see, what? See, God, God is still working. So right now, normally, my keys come down because that's the way God is running his universe. He's open my miracles then. Listen, they come down like this because that's God's providence. He just, that's the way he's running it normally. Now, when, a miracle is when he works it in an extraordinary way. We'll see that later. He works it in an extraordinary way. But, but God is working everything. So providence means that God is operating his universe and taking it to its intended goal he did not wind it up like a clock and then leave it to run on its own. I said that before the slides, didn't I? Providence, not like this, is history, but as his story. God is writing the script. Everything that's happening is according to God's pre-planned script. And in providence means he didn't just write it and leave it for everybody to work it out. He is working out the plan that he planned. Now, miracles are simply... God exerting his providential power by which he operates his universe in an extraordinary way to communicate a revelation to get a response of wonder. So God at any time can operate his universe in an extraordinary way. And that's what we would call a miracle, at least I would, theologically speaking. Does that make sense? So let me apply all this. Here's the verse I used to apply. There's several others, but this is a good one. We've got all these cogs in the, the operation of life. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. Those of us who have been called according to his purpose, his great plan. We love God. He makes every single thing, good or bad, work together for an ultimate good. For an ultimate good. God's salvation. I'm going to stop here. How about we pick up here next time? Yes. It's been a long class. Yes. All right. We're going to pick up with God's salvation.